Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for the introduction and the invitation to take part in this uh, virtual symposium. Sorry, I can't be with you in person, but one day soon, hopefully, we'll be there again. Um, I am uh, delighted to talk with you about a topic, a multiple system atrophy, that I think is underappreciated, underdiagnosed, and I'd like to see if we can try and uh, help that, at least by uh, talking about the disease today. A couple of disclosures. Uh, I will be mentioning some of the books that we've written over the years, and I will at the end talk about Biohaven uh, because of its relevance for MSA uh, clinical trials going forwards. So let's jump right in. Uh, multiple system atrophy, MSA, what is this thing? MSA is a sporadic disease that does not run in families with only rare exceptions in one investigator's group. Uh, it's a neurodegenerative disease and it results from a misfolding and aggregation of a protein called alpha synuclein. It's characterized by a cerebellar ataxia syndrome and or Parkinsonism with autonomic failure and usually with pyramidal tract signs. It has distinctive associated clinical features and distinctive neuroimaging uh, findings uh, with brain MRI and with the CT and PET, but we won't be discussing those. So that's the big picture. MSA as an entity goes back a few years now. It was uh, introduced as a term in the late 60s to designate two different conditions. One is called shy drager syndrome, which is a... Uh, um, a autonomic neuropathy with dropping blood pressure when one stands up, and Oliver Ponto cerebellar atrophy. Uh, a few years later, uh, Neil Quinn put together Shy Drager, OPCA, and striatonigral degeneration, which is a form of Parkinsonism that does not generally respond to levodopa, and put those together as MSA. So here in his uh, uh, cartoon, idiopathic orthostatic hypertension and Shy Drager syndrome, with OPCA and striatonigral generation, and came up with the term MSA. At the same time, MSA was shown to be a consequence of glial cytoplasmic inclusions in the nervous system. So there's an underlying pathology of the MSA designation for these three diseases, striatonigral generation, Oliver Ponto cerebellar atrophy, and Shine Drager. And then uh, Dr. Quinn reviewed this recently, to provide a history of the disease. Now, one can tell from this that there are basically three phenotypes of MSA, uh, the Parkinsonism, ataxia, and the pure autonomic failure. So MSAP, previously striatonigral degeneration, MSAC, previously sporadic OPCA, and the pure autonomic failure, Shy Drager. We'll be discussing MSAP and MSAC primarily. Now, MSA is one of three conditions that you know that are a result of a problem with alpha synuclein uh, aggregation and misfolding. Parkinson's and Lewy body are well known to you. MSA is the smaller group uh, in this three uh, that we need to understand in greater detail. Here's the problem. This is alpha synuclein. It aggregates in glial cells, as we see here, um, in MSA and particularly in the oligodendroglia that produce myelin, and we'll see the consequence on imaging in a while. It affects neurons in Parkinson's, Lewy body, and MSA. Here's the neurons in the different conditions with the uh, misfolded and aggregated uh, alpha synuclein cytoplasmic inclusions. It uh, has a, uh, a frequency of about two to five cases per 100,000, so there's around 15,000 patients in the US at this time is the, is the uh, expectation. Its disease, uh, the disease begins in the mid 50s, and the survival has been thought to be about eight, uh, eight and a half years, maybe seven and a half years in, in women, but the survival, I think, is a little longer now uh, with better treatment. Uh, the uh, uh, male female ratio is such that men are supposedly more effective than women. I've not seen that in our clinic. Uh, I don't see a, a, a gender predominance, but that's the overall uh, view. The Parkinsonian form is more common in the West, but the cerebellar form is seen in the Far East, uh, unless you're in my clinic in which they're mostly cerebellar. Uh, it was taught that the Parkinsonian version was a little uh, more lethal, uh, 
the survival more recently seems to be about the same. If you take all comers with ataxia that do not have a family history, about 30% of those patients may in fact turn out to have MSA. So this is not uh, an uncommon problem. The survival, both in a, uh, in a study back in the late 1990s and more recently in our group, turns out to be around 10, 12 years or so uh, at, at maximum. And in our hands, a similarly to about 10 to 12 years for those who had a pathology and those who didn't have pathology on but uh, had a clinical diagnosis, the, the uh, survival was somewhat longer. So we're hopeful that there is a way to interfere with the uh, pathophysiology and treatment options to try and make life longer. So this is a neurodegenerative brain disorder. Let's describe the issues that we're facing here. Ataxia, which is impairment of gait and balance, incoordination of the arms and legs, which is dysmetria, impaired articulation or dysarthria, swallowing difficulties, setting people up for aspiration pneumonia, and impaired eye movements. That's a cerebellar motor syndrome. The basal ganglia manifestations are like Parkinson's. You know, the slowness, rigidity, with or without tremor. And the autonomic ner nervous system problems pre present with a blood pressure drop uh, with standing, and then early on impaired bladder control, often with constipation and erectile dysfunction in men. The other features that are part of this constellation include REM sleep behavior disorder, acting out dreams, violent thrashing, yelling, kicking, screaming in the dreams, often with uh, very vivid nightmares, pathologic laughing and crying, a lack of ability to control the emotional expression. Often there's fatigue and there may be muscle cramps and other movement disorders like restless leg syndrome. Examination will show reflex changes, the hyperreflexia of, of uh, the corticospinal system involvement and often with stiffness. So that's the major features of the different presentations of MSA. Let's just talk about the ataxia for a moment. Now, we've known for a long time, going back to the uh, early uh, 1900s and before, that there is a difficulty with gait control, upper extremity control, speech and eye movements that used to be thought of as a cerebellar clinical syndrome. I'll just give a one-liner to say that this is now in fact the cerebellar motor syndrome because we now know that cerebellum is engaged in cognitive and emotional processing as well, uh, but we won't be discussing that today. Let me show you, because you may not have seen this often, the gait impairment uh, of a patient with cerebellar ataxia. These are not MSA patients, but the gait is similar. It's an unsteady gait, a little widened stance, a difficulty with turning, extra steps to turn, the placement of the feet is a little irregular, and people are imbalanced, and he would not be able to walk a straight line which is an early indicator of the trial of the problem. The finger to nose test uh, has the difficulty at the end point with the tremor as she reaches for my finger and also for her nose. And as this degrades, there's more and more problem with the arm control at the elbow as well. That's a finger to nose test. The heel to shin test with placement of the heel on the knee sliding down the shin shows a difficulty with maintenance of the heel on the shin. Here it's quite severe with side to side movements. And then finally, we look at the eye movements as she pursues my finger, there's saccadic intrusion into pursuit. And then she has an astagmus with lateral gaze. So those are the cardinal motor manifestations in addition to the dysarthria of the cerebellar motor syndrome. Let's look at the cerebellar anatomy for a moment because I'll show this to you in imaging. This is a, a schematic of the cerebellum with the white matter of the cerebellum and the white matter in the folium, each little folium of the cerebellum and the deep nuclei. And you can see this on MRI. This is a post-mortem high-resolution MRI of the human cerebellum showing the nuclei, uh, the cerebellar folium and the white matter and the cerebellar white matter within the body of the structure itself. Uh, the pons is here and the olive is in the medulla. The pons has a massive middle cerebellar pedunc projection to the cerebellum which one can see with some nice new imaging techniques these days showing the fibers moving from pons into cerebellum and the pons conveys information from the cerebral hemispheres through pons into cerebellum. This is an MRI of a healthy control. I want you to see the nice plump vermis, the belly of the pons, and here's the olive. In the coronal plane, it's nice and full. Here's the pons in the axial view with a large middle cerebellar peduncle. Now, uh, what happens in MSA in the cerebellar form is the pons shrinks and the cerebellum shrinks. 
So this is a postmortem of tiny little ponds. The medulla has shrunk and you don't even see the olive protuberance as you should. And the cerebellum shrinks as well, largely because it's losing all of its white matter. This is a healthy control at MSA cerebellum. So now you see instead of the plump cerebellum, you're losing the volume and you see the prominence of these cerebellar fissures. In the midline, the ponds have become flattened, the cerebellum is small. And instead of looking like a nice rounded contour of the ponds, it becomes shrunken. Um, and here's the peduncles, and these are very small. And you develop this thing called a hot cross bun sign, which is characteristic, although not pathognomonic, but it doesn't occur early, it occurs late. So what one sees is that the cerebral hemispheres look fine, but the cerebellum becomes shrunken, the fourth ventricle is large, the pons develops a hot cross bun sign, and the middle cerebellar peduncles are small uh, with a uh, signal change as one sees here. This is a woman I've been following for years. In 2011, when her symptoms were mild, she had a relatively, relatively good looking cerebellum and brain stem. And as things have evolved, the pons have become progressively flatter, the cerebellum has shrunken. The pons state loses its uh, convex contour, looks like this. Uh, the middle peduncles have become very small, and he has a hot cross bun sign. So progressive evolution in this devastating disease uh, where the white matter gets wiped out. The, the white matter in the cerebellum is gone. So here's some autopsy findings just to make the point. Healthy controlled big plump cerebellum white matter in the folium. In MSA, the cerebellar white matter has to, disappeared. Uh, and uh, is similarly in the cerebellar folia. This is because on the histology, the white matter lamina gets wiped out. This is what used to be this plump lamina in the folium. And the white matter space between the cortex and the nuclei has shrunk markedly uh, with some change in the nuclei, but not as much as in the white matter because of the oligodendroglial involvement. The Purkinje neurons do get uh, affected. Uh, here, this is normal. The Purkinje neurons have gone. Uh, the white matter of the cerebellum in the cortex, the molecular, is affected, and there's a dropout in the granule cells as well. Now, in MSAP, the Parkinsonian version, the putamen, which is lying here, is markedly affected and shrunken, as you see here. So the putamen in MSAP gets smaller. And as you'll learn in a moment, in MSAC, as they evolve, they develop a Parkinsonism because of the putamen involvement. Here's a nice plump putamen with its normal uh, neurons scattered around. In MSAP or very late MSAC, when the Parkinsonism sets in as well, the shrunken gliotic putamen with the uh, depletion of neurons and the gliosis in the putamen. One can see on MRI, the findings of the putamen on postmortem manifested here in the axial section in the posterior third of putamen is hypo intense on flare imaging. So, this is a nice impo and an important, helpful sign to look for, reflecting the glial cytoplasmic inclusions in the neurons of the putamen. The substantial nigra is involved as well in MSAP, where the uh, normal integrity of the substantial nigra and the scattered melanocyte containing neurons of the SN are now devastated, shrunken and gliotic uh, substantial nigropause uh, compactor uh, seen here in the uh, microscopy high power. And finally, in the series of pathologies to give a sense of the multiple system component of MSA, there's a thoracic spinal cord. Lying over here is the intermediate lateral cell column, which is important for blood pressure control and autonomic neuropathy. And this is um, devastated in uh, this disease. And in the sacral spinal cord, the ONIF nucleus uh, which is important for the bladder control, is also devastated in MSA. So how do you make a diagnosis of this disease? There's no blood test that makes a diagnosis. It's a clinical diagnosis which can be supported in some instances by imaging. So the clinical diagnosis through a series of, of discussions in the field over the years produces consensus criteria for the diagnosis of the MSA. The definite MSA diagnosis requires pathology, and demonstration of these alpha synuclein positive glial cytoplasmic inclusions with or without the uh, striatum, the nigra, and the uh, cerebellum uh, pons and olive involvement. That's a pathology. Probable and possible require two things autonomic neuropathy and either ataxia or Parkinsonism. What distinguishes probable from possible is a severity of the bladder involvement and the severity of the blood pressure drop. So this is available for review. 
Let me simplify this. Definite MSA is a neuropathologic diagnosis. People have come to autopsy, patients uh, have agreed to, and families have engaged in brain donation, and you demonstrate the findings. Possible MSA is either ataxia or Parkinsonism. There is urinary urgency or frequency, but they still have bladder control. They're running to the bathroom much more frequently, or they may not quite get there in time, but they know they have to go, and erectile dysfunction very early in the men. And the blood pressure drops, but less than 30 millimeters of mercury from lying to standing. Probable has the same thing, ataxia or Parkinsonism, but the bladder now doesn't work. They're either incontinent, they have no control over bladder, or they have retention that requires catheterization and erectile dysfunction, and the blood pressure drop is greater than or equal to 30 millimeters of mercury. So you can tell from this that blood pressure is really important for the diagnosis of possible or probable MSA. So how do you do that? Have you, this, this may be simple, but it's important. Take the blood pressure of the patient lying down. The convention is for a minute or two. Have them stand for three minutes, then some discussion, two minutes or three minutes. So we, we use three minutes. And then take the blood pressure again with your patient still standing. So the, the bottom line here is that apart from asking your patient about REM sleep behavior disorder and erectile dysfunction, this is probably the most cost-effective examination that you can do in the office for the diagnosis of MSA. And that's a point on the REM sleep behavior disorder. If you ask the patient, they're going to say their sleep is fine. And if you've had this experience, you may know that the person sitting next to your patient, who may, who's the bed partner, or maybe even the, house, the housemate, will look at you with an astonished uh, gaze because far from the sleep being fine, this person is thrashing, yelling, kicking, and screaming in the sleep, and they have no idea this is going on. That's the characteristic feature of RBD, REM sleep behavior disorder. This is the uh, Unified Multiple System Atrophy Rating Scale, or UMSARS, to give you a sense of the features on the history and the exam that go wrong in MSA. So just to, this is a nice overview. Speech, swallowing, handwriting, handling utensils, the ability to dress, perform hygiene, gait, falling, blood pressure dropping, uh, the orthostasis, orthostasis with uh, graying of vision or lightheadedness when you stand up, urinary function, sexual function looking largely for erectile dysfunction, and then bowel function mostly for constipation. And the exam looks for the facial expression for the Parkinsonism, speech disorder, eye movement abnormalities, tremors, either at rest or with action, change in tone, rapid alternating movements, finger tapping, leg agility, the heel to shin testing, getting up from a chair. Can you stand? What's your posture like as in Parkinsonism? Uh, what's the body sway as you do perturbation? And how is the gait? And then the blood pressure, as we discussed, either two minutes or three minutes of standing to then check your blood pressure. So the summary for MSA-C, the cerebelliform, that came out of our review of, of uh, our patients over many years, in the ataxia center is a simple statement like this. An adult in midlife who presents with a sporadic, out of the blue, slowly evolving ataxia with accompanying autonomic features of otherwise unexplained bladder issues, its frequency, urgency, or incontinence, and more severely, with or without unexplained erectile dysfunction, who also has evidence of volume loss in the cerebellum, pons, and middle peduncles on imaging, that person has MSAC. So that's the constellation. It's a set of features, both on history exam and on MRI. When you combine that with the blood pressure drop and the sleep behavior disorder, that's MSA. Uh, the extrapyramidal features may develop later. Corticospinal features and pathologic laughing and crying can evolve during the course of the disease, but they may not be present early on. Now, these are key features for both MSA cerebellar form and Parkinson form. Let's go back to the top. Early on, and often predating the motor symptoms, is a REM sleep behavior disorder with or without erectile dysfunction. There may be urinary urgency or frequency, uh, delayed initiation or incomplete emptying, and there may be orthostatic hypotension with uh, presyncopal symptoms, but that may not be present at the beginning. That may come on later. Through the history and the exam, they have either cerebellar motor syndrome, the ataxia, or they have Parkinsonism. And sometimes they have both slowing and bradykinesia and dysmetria either in the same limb or occasionally you can get ataxia on one side and Parkinsonism on the other. Depends where the uh, glial cytoplasmic conclusions are affecting the brain. 
imaging shows progressive atrophy of the pons, middle cerebellar peduncles, and cerebellum on MRI. And in MSAP, there's poor response to levodopa. There may be pathologic laughing or crying. There may be constipation. Uh, bear in mind that the MSAC versions, bradykinesia or Parkinsonism, often presents late, um, uh, but it may also be present early uh, with the ataxia. And a little help, helpful thing for differentiating MSA Parkinson's from Parkinson's disease is that unlike Parkinson's disease, in MSAP, there may in fact be some volume loss in the middle cerebellar peduncles, in the pons, and the smaller cerebellum. So let's spend the last few minutes discussing what do you do about these patients. Once you've got the diagnosis, you think this is happening, how do you work it up? Well, first you take the history, you do the exam, and you perform some limited investigations. The minor, the, the major features at the presentation are difficulty with gait and balance, speech is not right, and handwriting goes. That trio is, is a strong indicator right from the get-go. So ask about speech and handwriting. Uh, if the patient's coming in with a gait problem. The time course is insidious. This is not weeks uh, as, or months as in a subacute ataxia, and it's also not decades. People don't last that long, unfortunately. It is a few years. There is no family history of an ataxia disorder. This is not a familial condition. And then when you ask about erectile dysfunction and REM sleep behavior disorder, and you ask about the bladder, that together with those other symptoms should clue you in right away that this could be MSA. There may be pathologic laughing and crying, and they may have symptoms of presyncope from orthostasis. On the examination, you look for the ataxia I've just shown you. Parkinsonism, you know well, uh, with the slowness and the, the hunched posture, and the, uh, there may be tremor, but not always, increased tone and, and cogwheeling, and there may be hyperreflexia, uh, sometimes with upgoing toes, but not always. And then check for the orthostasis, with the blood pressure, as I discussed. Later on in MSAP, you can get two uh, suggestive signs. One is the PISA sign, when people lean over to the side, and the other is camptochromia, where the head flexes on the, on the, uh, on the neck. Uh, these are quite late in MSA, Parkinsonism in particular. The first thing, in addition to the routine labs, that you want to look at is the MRI, and you look for those characteristic findings that I've shown you for MSAC, and you may find some changes in the putamen and MSAP, but that may not come on until later. It doesn't always help in MSAP, but certainly in either MSAC or P, you're looking for changes in the cerebellum and brain stem to help cue you into this possibility. Now, if this has come on within a year or so, look for the important differential diagnosis, depending on the disease. For the ataxias, look for the immune ataxias. Uh, the autoimmune panel may be important, gluten ataxia. Uh, there may be deficiency states, maybe thiamine, it could be alcohol. Uh, watch out in Parkinson's disease for the case we have on the ward now of, of manganese intoxication, uh, rare, but these things do occur. Uh, and also looking for the routine laboratory. You'll notice I have not put genetic testing on here because somebody who's got a syndrome of a year or two with this constellation is not a genetic ataxia and would not be expected to be a genetic cause of Parkinson's disease. So. There are things that you do want to know and things that you, that you do not need to order at this time. And if you have these, what I've highlighted in yellow, the REM sleep, the expectile dysfunction, the bladder, the orthostasis, and the MRI brain changes, that's not a genetic ataxia. To make the point, you can get all of the cerebellar atrophy in genetic ataxias. But these, for example, spinal cerebellar ataxias type 1 or 2 uh, are a much more slowly evolving disorder. They don't come on over two or three, two years or maybe even three with a, with a clear change uh, um, every six months where the patient is, is declining. Now, there are things that you can do, uh, although we cannot cure this yet, and I'll come to that in the next slide, there are symptom-based treatments. And this includes treatment for the REM sleep behavior disorder, both as much for the patient's partner as for the patient to try and give them a good night's sleep and have them waking up refreshed in the morning. Uh, clonazepam, melatonin work, and CPAP remarkably works for REM sleep behavior disorder. You can treat the urinary urgency with the available agents. Uh, if there's a retention, you can do bladder stimulants, the may need catheterization, and in severe cases, uh, suprapubic cystostomy. Erectile dysfunction is treated with the usual medications. 
make sure to prevent urinary tract infections and then treat them when they occur, uh, because this is a cause of death in patients, the UTI that then spreads to uh, systemic sepsis. We have excellent treatments for orthostatic hypotension. Turns out that pyridostigmine early on is a smart drug. It works when the patient is standing, not when they're lying. So if it's a relatively mo modest case of orthostatic hypotension, pyridostigmine may actually be helpful. But then you move on to flood cortisone that works at a longer time course through the day. And then on top of that, as necessary, one can add mitodrine, either five or 10 milligrams in short acting bursts to try and keep the pressure up. And then newer medicines such as droxydopa can be helpful. Uh, you can watch the salt intake, um, sometimes uh, leg stockings, but those are uncomfortable. We generally manage well with the orthostatic hypertension by careful management of the blood pressures. Constipation can be a real bear and uh, is managed with all the usual approaches and uh, importantly, try and keep the bowels moving in a constant way uh, on a regular daily basis. Secretions can be managed, can be a problem later in the course. Scopolamine patch, glycopyrrolate, and then this one we've learned from the uh, uh, late life, the sort of latent disease state from the uh, palliative care folks is atropine eye drops sublingually can be very effective. You can treat tremor. Tremor in ataxia actually responds to resting tremor to primidone beta blockers and sometimes to triexphenidol. Uh, sometimes amantadine really is all work. Uh, weighted vests uh, may be helpful. These are not that successful in ataxia from MSA, but certainly worth trying. A good 30% of patients with MSAP respond to carbidopa levodopa. Uh, sometimes the addition of entacopone uh, can be helpful. So don't give up on your patient who has MSAP or the Parkinsonian features of MSAC late in the course uh, because they may respond. Sometimes dysarthria gets better with the SSRIs. And while you're on that, depression can be a major issue with needs or requires treatment. Watch out for prevention of aspiration pneumonia. You can treat spasticity. And uh, these folks are key in the management of these long-term patients. Physical therapy, occupational therapy, our speech and swallow teams, these are as integral to the care of these patients as everything else on the slide. Uh, and the multidisciplinary approach to the management of this disease, as well as the other neurodegenerative disorders, is, uh, is our secret weapon, frankly, in the management and the care of these patients and their families. We use the antioxidant vitamins, uh, vitamin E, C, B complex, and coenzyme Q10. There is an antioxidant piece to these neurodegeneration disorders. Uh, the mitochondria are a constant feature in the neurophysiology, neuropathology, and therefore uh, are worth a try. There's even a coenzyme Q2 deficient ataxia, and so these are worth trying. There's minimal support for IVIG. I found antibodies in some patients who have MSA and have used it, uh, sometimes effective, but not always. And then finally, where's the field moving? Well, thankfully, it finally is moving. Uh, we now have the first uh, clinical trial for uh, MSA is myeloperoxidase inhibitor by Biohaven. This is a clinical trials.gov. Uh, reviewed uh, the, the, where the field was moving to, reviewed uh, by uh, Dr. Masley and his team a few years ago. Uh, and here is the pipeline from the multi-system atrophy uh, coalition showing what's out there to try and interfere with the biology of alpha synuclein to actually get to the bottom of the, of the disease pathophysiology. And what people are looking at now is immunotherapy uh, uh, targeting the toxic oligomeric structure of alpha synuclein to try and dissolve the toxic oligomers and prevent new ones from forming. So this is where things are moving to uh, at the level of um, uh, targeted immunotherapy for alpha synuclein in the hope that we can do more than symptomatic therapy, but actually interfere with the underlying neurobiology of this really devastating disease uh, that is underappreciated and underdiagnosed and uh, hopefully by, by paying attention to it, by knowing the few simple rules about the clinical features and its imaging characteristics and making the diagnosis, we can actually have an impact on finding these patients to get them into clinical trials early so we can make an impact and uh, help them improve their lives and also try and put an end uh, to this scourge of MSA. So thank you very much for your attention. If you need to reach me, my email was at the top of the slide. I'm easily findable and uh, be happy to address any questions.
uh, in the chat. Uh, and also, uh, if you want to drop me a note or an email, please feel free to do that. So thank you. Uh, good luck with the care of your patients. And um, thanks again for your attention.